Let's do case nine. Um, this is a 25 year old woman with a nodule on the back. Again, my apologies. Uh, they, this is the best case I have to show this and I didn't have it scanned yet. I'm working on that, but we can see here. So here's the, my first question was, what is this, what is happening in this photo and what does it mean? And then I'll show you the rest of the pictures and you can tell me what tumor. I guess I'll go ahead and click through that and someone can volunteer. I'll come back these, I'll just let you see them all. Okay, great. Um, so that first photo that you showed um, looks like uh, cells encropping a nerve. Good, and this is a nerve, and these are cells completely wrapped around that nerve, hugging the whole thing, a donut around the nerve. Good, now I'll click through the rest of them, and then I'll come back and let you describe. Here's another little nerve, and another view of it, and again, more nerves and another nerve. Okay, now, what are we dealing with here and what is the significance of that nerve involvement? So um, there is an abundance of polygonal plump eosinophilic cells that have granular cytoplasm, their nests and cords and obviously kind of surrounding some of the peripheral nerves. Um, it has irregular borders and you're kind of infiltrated, even the nests are not encapsulated. So um, it looks like something maybe of neural sheath origin. Good. Yeah, here's that I uh, here's that you can kind of see from low power that infiltration you described is not well circumscribed or encapsulated, right? It trickles out between the collagen and there's lots of collagen trapped up in the midst. It's kind of just trickling throughout the dermis. Good. I love that you described it that way. I think that's a very important clue. Okay. So um, I imagine the S100 would probably be very positive. Yes, it would. Uh, S100 would be very positive. Uh, because I think it's a granular cell tumor. Excellent job. Great description. And yes, this is a beautiful, perfect example of a granular cell tumor with the nests and trabeculae of, of a kind of a syncytial arrangement of these epithelioid or polygonal cells with granular cytoplasm that's pale pinkish gray. And they're kind of trickling between the background collagen. I find that they almost always do that. They don't make like a nice circumscribed nodule. They just kind of weave in between the collagen and around things and into the fat. I've even seen them go into the muscle. And, and that pattern of growth does not imply aggressive behavior. That's just the way they grow. Now, what about the nerve uh, surrounding what do I need to, you know, what kind of comment do I need to make about that? Or uh, does it change it what we call this? It's actually not something to worry about. Very good. Yes, this is something that is not something to worry about. And I first learned about this actually once I was in practice after fellowship. Um, maybe I was pulled in fellowship and just forgot. But but uh, Jennifer McNiff gave a talk. She was a past president of ASTP and a really she's a wonderful dermopath at Yale. And, uh, and dermatologist, and she gave a great talk at uh, ASDP long ago when I was early in my career and talked about how perineural involvement, I don't call it invasion because it doesn't mean the same thing here, perineural involvement by gray cell tumor is not only allowable, it's actually present in the majority of cases. And in their, their study, I think they found it in like 88% or something, close to 90% of cases. So if, if you start looking for it, you will actually find it, it is, it is there. Um, perineural involvement in granular cell uh, tumor is okay, is benign, and is actually very common in this, um, in this entity. So I'll put a link to a paper describing this down below. So in general, when I see this, I do not mention it at all. In the past, I don't take consults anymore because it was getting too busy for me to handle. But in the past, I used to take consults. And when people would send it in and say, oh, there's nerve involvement, then I would comment on it. Yes, we see that in granular cell tumor. And it's a totally fine, benign feature. And when you think about it, granular cell tumor, even though they look very different from other nerve sheath tumors because of their abundant granular cytoplasm, they are neural tumors. So we see neurofibromas involving nerve. We see schwannomas involving nerve. Why should granular cell tumor be any different, right? It makes perfect sense that it would involve a nerve. It just looks so different from nerve and, and kind of reminds us the way carcinomas or melanomas grow around the nerve, I think. So it really activates that part of our brain that thinks, oh, perineural invasion, um, because it looks so distinctly different from the nerve itself. And so um, usually, I mean, these are H&E diagnoses, although there are some rare other form of granular cell tumor that's non-neural. I mean, it's a somewhat controversial entity that um, you can, we can talk about a different day. But in any case, if you want, you can stain them. They're going to be S100 and SOX10 positive, like any nerve sheath thing would be. And they usually will also express CD68, although I never do this. It's not needed. PAS could also be used because it'll highlight that granular cytoplasm. 
because these cells are granular because why? What, what is filling up their cytoplasm and making it look granular? Yeah, these are phagolysosomes, and CD68 is not a histiocyte marker. It is actually a phagolysosome marker. So any cell that has a lot of phag phagolysosomes in it are going to be positive for CD68. It is not a specific marker of histiocytes. It's sensitive because histiocytes usually have phagolysosomes, right? So, um, so in any case, yes, co-expression of S100 and CD68 for testing purposes. I think PAS will also stain the granules. In real life, I usually diagnose them on H&E, or I might do an S100, but honestly, I usually... When they look perfect like this, I usually just diagnose them on H&E myself. So in any case, um, there are rare, rare examples of malignant granular cell tumor. I've only seen in study sets. And then there are some that have some atypical features that still usually behave indolently. And I'll put a link to a paper about that down below about the features that help you decide when a granular cell tumor is atypical. Random scattered nuclear pleomorphism, totally fine in these, just like it's totally fine in neurofibroma or schwannoma. Random so-called degenerative nuclear atypia, not a problem at all. If I start seeing spindling, um, real extensive, large nucleoli, um, mitotic activity, then I start worrying and I always go pull that paper out and read about it to make sure that I've got the criteria right for deciding how much atypia is too much. But random atypia, don't worry. Perineural involvement, don't worry. Sometimes these can be multifocal. You can have patients with multiple granular cell tumors, which is always seems a little scary, but it's also fine to have um, in these patients. And uh, was one last thing. Oh yeah, this case doesn't show it, but classically these are taught as inducing a lot of uh, mucosal if they, if they arise in the tongue, which is a common site, or epidermal hyperplasia that can mimic squamous cell carcinoma, and it can. I've seen cases where it's very dramatic and it sure looks for the world like an invasive well-diff squamous cell carcinoma, all reactive. So the general rule, especially for pathologists looking at something on the tongue, if you think it's a well-diff cancer, look in the submucosal connective tissue to make sure you're not missing granular cell tumor there. I've also seen ones that had verrucous looking change on the surface. Um, and just make sure you check down here in the collagen. If you find granular cells, stop. Don't call it cancer. It's probably just reactive change from the granular cell tumor. But you don't have to have that change. I see plenty of granular cell tumors just like this where there's a little hyperplasia, but nothing that looks like pseudoepitheliomatous or that would be confused with squamous cell carcinoma. And the final thing is that people like to talk about these things called pustulo-ovoid bodies of milion, and they're like little, uh, little blobs of granular cytoplasm that stand out. Let me see if I got one in here. Can't remember. They, like right here, see there are these little tiny little clustered aggregates of granules in the cytoplasm that stand out with a little space around them. I don't really feel like you need them to make the diagnosis, but people talk about them, so now you know. Now you've, you've seen a, the pustulo ovoid body. Uh, here's another one right there, okay? That's granular cell tumor with benign perineural involvement, okay? Uh, any questions about that? Well, guys, I only went a half an hour over time. I hope you'll forgive me, and hopefully it was worth your while. Um, and if you have any questions, always you can message me or contact me online. And anyone watching this online, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day, and check uh, down below for links uh, to more content related to this video. Thank you.